We are going to talk about bats today. Um, bats are so amazing and incredible. They have quite a bad reputation. So when you've heard of bats before, you've probably heard of them in relation to this guy. So this is my Lego Dracula. Um, and bats have, have quite for quite a long time in history and folklore been given a um, little bit of a bad rap really. They're seen as being animals that are associated with um, evil or, or, or things that are quite scary. But bats are actually not scary at all. So bats are mammals, so like humans, they feed their young with milk and they give birth to live young. Uh, they do this whilst hanging upside down, so they're quite amazing. Uh, and actually they make up quite a lot of mammals. So there's um, 1,400, 1,400 species of bats in the world. And they have bad reputation because three out of the 1,400 species feed on blood. Uh, and only one of them ever goes near humans and very rarely feeds on human blood. It's usually cows and things like that. So one out of 1,400 species that feeds at all, ever, on, on human blood. Um, and all the rest of them eat all sorts of different things. So in some parts of the world we have fruit bats. So those bats eat, eat fruit, they pollinate trees, uh, and they're, they're usually quite big, so we call them the mega bats. The bats we have in the UK are called microbats and all of our British bats feed on insects. We have quite a few different types of bats in Britain. In fact, we've got 17 different species um, and they all look different, behave differently and live in different places. So we have bats like this one, which is the brown long-eared bat, which has really big ears. And we also have bats like this one, which is the lesser horseshoe bat. And I've actually got a headless lesser horseshoe that I found in somebody's barn right here. And this just goes to show you how small some of these bats are. So this is um, a lesser horseshoe. You can see its feet where it was hanging. So these bats, and there's a sister species also called the greater horseshoe, are quite unusual in that you see these hanging in buildings. But lots of bat species will tuck up in small crevices uh, and other places. And this is one of the species that does that. So there's probably these type of bats very close to where you live. And you might even have these in your roof and that is a pipistrelle bat so these pipistrelle bats weigh the same as a 10p piece they're absolutely tiny and they can squeeze through gaps of about a centimeter and a half and this just goes to show you all the different types of bats we have in the uk so i've already showed you these bats that hang the horseshoe bats on this end we have the long-eared bats here a couple of species of long-eared bats we have the tiny pipistrelle bats over here and then we have all sorts of other bats in between including some quite big bats like like this noctual uh, and we have some crazy looking bats like we have the barbastel which is really dark colored bat it's kind of got black fur almost and its ears join in the middle so it's, it's quite a funky looking bat some of our british bats just like to live in trees so there's species like noctual that you won't really find in buildings they will just live in trees and if you walk past a tree, if it's on a warm day, you might even hear the tree chattering. And that might be because there's bats living in it. The kind of trees they like tend to be really big old trees or sometimes quite young trees, but trees that have holes or gaps in. So where a woodpecker might have made a hole or where, where a, a branch has snapped off. If it's created a hole of anything more than about a centimetre, you could actually have bats living inside it. But most of our British bats also like to live in buildings. Uh, and they're not always as fussy as you might think. So a lot, a lot of our bats, including the pipistrelle species, will live quite happily in towns and cities. In fact, they get up to quite big numbers in towns and cities. Uh, and you can actually help them by creating habitat as well. So I convinced Rich to let us put this bat box inside of our house, we've got up here. Uh, and this is just a wooden bat box, but there's lots of different types. In fact, I'd recommend some of what's called woodcrete ones. Um, but the perfect place to put a bat box is about that height, so about four metres up on the side of a house. Uh, we don't have any windows near here, so, so this bit's really dark at night, so it needs, it needs to be dark at night. Uh, and ideally somewhere that's going to catch the sun. So ideally the south side of your house um, or, or building. You can even make your own bat boxes, so there's quite a few designs and things like that you can do. There's also a few different ways that you can actually make features. So up there we have a glacier board. 
uh, and you can actually make holes under the fascia board. Uh, holes to let bats in need to be about two centimetres by about five centimetres. Obviously, get your parents to go up the ladder, don't, don't do that yourselves. Um, but there's lots of different ways. And if you come round this way, there's features like this which happen on all sorts of buildings. So up here, we've got a gap between the window and the, the, the wooden board above it. And that is an absolutely perfect place for bats to live. Um, sometimes if you have bats living there, you might find their droppings underneath it as well. Uh, and I'm going to show you in my loft how you can go about looking in there as well for bats. Uh, I should say bats are protected. So if you find any live bats, definitely retreat. Don't disturb them. Leave them alone. Um, but it's quite rare to actually find the bat themselves. Quite often you, fi you find their poo or you might find moth and butterfly wings, which is what they like to eat. A good place to start looking for them is if you're lucky enough to have an attic to go for a little poke around up there, obviously with some help from your parents. So I've come to have a quick look in my attic. Uh, I come up here a little bit and I know that there's, um, I've never found any bat droppings up here. Um, but I do have some bat droppings that I found in someone else's loft. So it's worth having a look. And there's a bit quite a simple test you can do to see whether you've got bat droppings or mouse droppings. So those are what I know are bat droppings. Ooh, there we go. And here, we have mouse droppings so they actually look quite similar they look really similar but there is a key difference between the two so if this is the mouse dropping and i'm rolling it between my fingers and it's really hard and it's not crumbling at all so that's the mouse dropping and this is the bat dropping let's get one of these and if i rub it between my fingers it crumbles to dust and even better the dust is really glittery I'm sure you can see that but it's got lots of tiny tiny pieces of insect inside it because that's what the bats have been eating so this is a key way of telling whether you've got bats in your loft it's quite rare to actually see a bat um, I've, I've been in lots of attics where I, and, and I occasionally see bats but quite often I actually find find the poo and this is really good evidence that bats have been there so in, your, in, your, in an attic, the, the things that are really good for bats is this kind of felt here. And if you see here, we've actually got a bit of ventilation into the roof. And this is exactly the kind of thing that bats can use. So this is a, a vent tile and there's a hole just under the tile on the outside. And then the bats can come in through here. Females gather in quite big numbers in, in the summer uh, and a roost can get up to um, maybe uh, 20 bats in some cases maybe 100 bats um, and the biggest roost get up to, to several hundred so you might have 700 bats in a roost I think the biggest roost in England is, is a couple of a couple of thousand uh, pipistrelle bats so the females gather in big numbers and they have their young together um, and they they do that because they like it really warm in their roosts um, so that they they're young and protected somewhere to live bats need a way to get between where they live and where they eat and in the countryside they use features like this this is a hedgerow just out the back of where we park our cars and you can see all the way around the field those are almost like bat roads and lots of bat species will follow follow them um, because they provide them with a bit of a map bats are really incredible at navigating um, and they have a really good knowledge of all their local area They'll feed in the same places each night. Sometimes they'll move around. They'll have favorite spots at different times of year. And they also hold territory. So sometimes the adults will pass on the knowledge to the younger bats, show them where, where the good feeding spots are, and they'll all gather their own favorite places that they like to go. So it's quite incredible really, thinking that they have this map in their mind of, of the whole landscape around them and they know all the different places to go. In towns and cities, they still use features, so if you think of things like railway lines, those are really popular with bats, parks, uh, green corridors, anything like that. So they're quite different to us in some ways, even though they're mammals, because they use sound to explore, explore the landscape. So if you think of a time when you might have been in a tunnel or somewhere with an echo, and you shout really loudly and the echo bounces off the walls, you can get maybe a rough idea of how long the tunnel might be by how many times you hear the echo. And bats are basically doing that, but in a much more sophisticated way. 
So they're shouting out of their mouth or sometimes out of their nose and their ears are gathering or sometimes their nose is gathering all the information about what's happening around them which is really really clever so they they can see people say blind as a bat but you can actually bats can actually see lots of bats actually have quite good eyesight but they're just so clever at using sound to find their way around so if you think about how loud birds are during the day um we don't really hear bats at night um and there's a reason for that and that's because they call at what's called ultrasonic frequencies so it's um, at frequencies which we can't hear with the human ears, although you lot might be able to hear it. So most bats call above a level of sound at, that, that's, that's called about 20 kilohertz. And most children can hear just about up to that range, whereas adults usually can hear maybe at 17 or 18 kilohertz. So, so we can hear lower frequencies and we lose the higher frequencies in our hearing as we get older. So if you listen out, and you think you're hearing some clicks or something like that, you, you probably are hearing bats. Um, and there's a few ways, because I'm an adult and I can't hear bats anymore, there's a few ways that I can go out and listen for bats. And all of them involve basically one of these. So this is essentially a bat translator. It's a, it's a, it's a bat detector. The best time to go bat spotting is when it's just starting to get dark. So this is about 40 minutes, half an hour after the sunset. Um, and we've got bats flying around our heads. Bats are really clever. People sometimes think they'll crash into you, they might land in your hair, but they can actually tell exactly what insect, species of insect they're after, just from the noises that they emit, which I'll tell you about a bit later. So they're definitely not going to crash into you. I've been watching bats for many years and I've never had one crash into me yet. Um, so it's really cool to just stand outside uh, and watch the bats feeding. We're on a nice dark lane here. Um, and you can hear this is my bat detector, which again I'll tell you a bit more about later. Um, and I'm just listening to all this is almost like a bat translator, and it means I can hear the calls the bats are making and work out what species. So I know at the moment we've got some pipistrelle species flying around. It's um, really nice dark lane, lots of vegetation on either side, and we're right by a big mature old tree that they might even live in. Different bats sound slightly different, so I'm going to do my bat impressions now. So pipistrelle bats do what's called the wet slap is their call or some people um, sometimes say they make raspberry noises so when they're flying around trying to find their way around the landscape they sound a bit like this but when they find food and they try and they try and zoom in on the food on the insect they sound a bit like this and they also sound a little bit like that when they're calling for other bats um, there's other species of bats that make different noises so the big bats like noxials make a kind of chip chop noise so they sound like chip chop chip chop chip chop when they're when you hear them on a bat detector like this um, and then the horseshoe bats sound like little aliens which is really brilliant so they sound like this <laughs> You might be lucky enough to see the bats uh, and if you if you see bats they also look a bit different obviously there's their size if you see bats in woodland usually they're behaving quite differently to bats that you might see by the river so you can get a bit of a clue that you've got some different bat species going on there um, always good to go out uh, just as it's getting dark at sunset or, or just before sunrise um, and the best time of, see, to, of year to see bats is between May and September most people will see bats that are flying maybe like four meters up something like that that are flying in squiggly patterns and that's usually pipistrelle bats so if you see quite a small bat although they can look that big with their with their wings out um you're very likely to have seen a pipistrelle all of our bats in the uk eat insects and if you plant things that are good for moths you will also be encouraging lots of bats as well um, some bats also eat flies so if you've got a pond for example which we talked about a few weeks ago you've made a pond then you've already made some bat food which is really really brilliant the kind of plants you might be looking at are things that have a lot of pollen and nectar particularly things that flower at night so over here we have the jasmine and this is this is kind of a, a really nice plant um, for lots of uh, insects I think even things like ivy are actually really good for insects as well honeysuckle all that kind of thing things basically that smell quite strongly and they'll attract lots of insects 